like blocks of demonstrations combined with AMA. So we'll just okay. kind of disperse the two. Okay, I will get the, oh no, all streamers are busy. Oh shit, uh, we can try in between group. No, now it's saying it's live streaming. Can you just check to see if it's active? Yeah. Oh, actually, Kai's there. Kai, can you check if the stream is working? Yeah, it says it is streaming, though. I'll check. It also said that it also says that all streamers are busy, so I'm a little confused. But uh, are you able to share screen, Z? Yeah, I will. I'm not yet, just because I'm right now, while you're pulling people together, I'm sorting some stuff out, figuring out what I want to share. Um, but it sounds like you need a minute. Yeah, I need I need about a minute. Yeah. Um, and Baron had to step out to a meeting, um, but I actually showed him some of this stuff, so I think I can continue to talk to him offline if he has specific questions. Yeah, for sure. Will he be back for conviction voting? He should only be like 10, 15 minutes, but it was oh. an impromptu thing, and so it wasn't. He just said to let you guys know he was held up, and he'd get back to us as soon as he could. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I I assume that. He'll really be more interested in conviction voting than CAG Pat. Yeah. So if there's one thing, uh, Z, in terms of like explaining all of these concepts, and that I think is, is no different, we, we want to start with the why. Um, why are we using these components? Um, once we have people's interest and attention and what problems it can solve for them, then we can delve into the how and explain the rigor and the and the backing that goes with these things that make this a useful tool. And, and we, actually, I have an idea. I'm going to send in the channel. We're going to actually start a little bit differently. I'm going to send in this channel something for you to share, Jeff, um, to pull up. These are some photos from the whiteboard from the conversation I just had with um, Baron in the interview or in the intermediate time. And I think it actually helped address this motivation because I didn't even understand what the questions were until he was asking them. And so maybe we can go over. Um, you sharing it in the corridor? Yeah, I'm just gonna send it in a second. I'm taking photos of the whiteboard right now. Because I'm not gonna redraw all this stuff, but I can make it available um, by sending it from my phone into the so that you can pull it up where people can see it yeah. clear. Oh, good. Comments back, Korg, share. Uh, apologize for sort of this. OK, so I just sent four photos. And what I'm going to ask you to do is put them up on the screen, starting with the, um, the one with three on it. The one with? The most stuff on it. Oh uh, yeah, okay. and I know this is going to be, I guess, a little bit of a, a hard because it's from a conversation. So don't be too scared. It's not nearly as messy as it it seems. I, I want to basically quickly explain the difference between um, the idea of what can happen and what does happen, and the fact that the way that this relates to engineering and to CAD CAD, so that when I start getting into examples and demos, people sort of got the right like mindset. Um, let me make sure that I'm, let's see, that, that, that's, oh, here we go, cool, okay. So if people are here, let's look first at the top, the top diagram. This is a representation of the bonding curve concept. We are saying that there's an initialization, that's the red line. We've got the price curve, which is the green line, and the, res and the supply curve, which is the blue line, and they're independent variable is the collateral that's measured in the reserve currency. I want to make a quick point. This is the shape of a thing we were calling the phase space, and it describes what can happen. If you zoom down to the one below it, this is something different. This is what does happen. And the dependent variable here is time. And the thing is that the system is moving in the phase space. So if you can think of it like the phase space is space, and time is how the world, how things change in that space. And this particular drawing shows the, the cliff, and then it shows the, the half-life vesting sort of as this bottom part that's blocking off um, the immediate sort of selling off of tokens. What I'm basically just showing here is that the phase space or the system's 
possible states are different from a realization, which is specific outcomes. And so with CAD-CAD, what we're really doing is studying in the engineering sense, the relation between these two things. One is the possible space and the other is the, the all of the possible things that happen that are specific. And relating those two requires mathematics and tools. And the tools that we're talking about are about how to understand what you can control and how it relates to what you can't control. Um, are there, and, and, and again, if there are any questions, this is just a chance for people to like, I want to make it sure that we understand that when we write equations, they're not about what will happen. They're about what can happen. And then what CAD CAD is helping us do is explore and test and evaluate lots of different things. So did everyone, I just want to make sure everyone caught that. So the, this as the phase space, um, like this is the bonding curve that we've been talk talking about. So this is like the, the price as it can go up and down. But this is not a time axis. So remember, we draw these arrows saying people may buy and it goes up, people may sell and it goes down. So when you actually plot that on a time graph, oops, sorry, this is going up the curve, going down the curve, going up the curve, going down the curve. When you plot it on on a time graph, it looks like uh, you know a volatile market. But we have this um, uh, vesting period. So you notice it doesn't go down in the beginning; it only goes up because these tokens are locked. So as more people enter the economy, and people can't sell yet, and now here the vesting period starts, so people can start to sell. So they will because they want to take some and, profits. And the people who are and the people who are speculating will be like, okay, now they can sell, so they will also sell too. Right. So now the market is is in this vesting period, and people are it's moving up and down the price curve on this diagram. But in time, it looks like a. Uh, potentially volatile market. But this is the phase base. This is what can happen. And when you plot it on time, this is what's actually happening. So we're moving up and down this curve in time. Just to make sure that's clear. Cool. And so what you have to adjust the camera for the Griff's laptop. Sorry. Thanks. Oh. Uh, it's also on the. Oh, sorry. Yeah, because I'm pointing at the board, aren't I? Yeah, it's for people who might watch this. Yeah, I have the I have the my screen shared with the um, with the diagram as well. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's not gonna be whoever talks is on yeah, the screen. So thanks. Okay, cool. So yeah, you want to dive into CAD CAD Z? Yeah. So so now we're gonna go to uh, a screen share that I'll share. So um, let me switch to my sharing application window. Okay, so now um, this, let me go to the right thing. All right, so this is a, I'm just basically in GitHub. Hold on, I've got to find the right screen. Okay, so CAD-CAD's engine is actually this thing called Diffie Q Sim CAD. Now, Josh and a couple of my team members have been working on this for some time, and we've been building these this engine. The engine essentially runs simulations. Simulations basically turn designs into results. And for our part, I'm not going to kind of go through this. This documentation is here and growing. And we would allow people, like anyone in this group has access to the, the Jupyter Hub server that GiveF is hosting. And we have you know opportunities for people to try it out, not necessarily by understanding how the engines work, but actually by coming up here and going to our tutorials, which are in this one, which a lot of the work lately has, has been in. And the tutorials contain some, uh, specifically we made these robot and marbles ones in order to sort of show people the features and like make simple models. I'm not gonna go through them. There are actually videos talking through these tutorials that we've already made, but they describe concepts about behaviors and mechanisms and how those behaviors and mechanisms interrelate to cause dynamics and how dynamics in turn give rise to potentially complex nonlinear phenomena even when the internal rules are simple. So CAD-CAD is essentially the, actually let me go to Lucid chart. It is essentially the um, uh, social and data science, sort of social science, economics, and data science equivalent of the control engineering, decision science, sort of AI stacks. This is kind of old. Actually, I should 
really get rid of that because um, it's not, sorry. Lots of stuff in here. I want to find a specific diagram, this one. So this is a high level understanding story-wise. Like CAD CAD is essentially. Can you zoom in in full screen? What was that? Can you zoom in in full screen? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cool. So essentially, the tooling for decision for robust, like strong decision science in the technical world lives in MATLAB. It's this is your aerospace defense robotics disciplines all using these really high grade decision systems, mathematically intense AI stuff to solve these automation challenges at a achieve high level goal through engineering process. And so CAD CAD is itself the image of that tech stack, in, but in the data science and social science and economics world. And while it's not yet open sourced, obviously we're here for common stack trying to get to the point where it will be open sourced and that we can maintain the community to, to build and expand the tech. But it's what I'm putting up in here is that the core value proposition is this green box. And you know, we might have some open questions about business models and whatnot. I'm not trying to sell anything right now, but with the understanding that what you build on top of open source software could still potentially be valuable. But because of this scientific Python CAD CAD stuff is meant to be baseline scientific equipment, we don't want it to be closed source the way MATLAB is. We want it to be open source. Um, so if I jump back to then the examples, I can show, you know, again, I like the robot in marbles, but I think it makes more sense for us to talk about the conviction prototypes um, because actually let me switch to, that's a, that's actually the different thing. Uh, this is what I want. Can you see this screen? It should say um, import network X at the top. Yeah, yeah we can see it. It would be nice if the text was just a little bit bigger, but we can see it. Hold on. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Oh, that's. Oh, yeah. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> okay. Old, old person phone. Yeah, but I, you know it's a video and the recording probably not that way. So, um, I, there's also a recording of me discussing this from a curation markets call. So I'm probably not gonna crazy overdo it. This is more about CAD CAD than about the the conviction prototype. But what I want to point out is that this system here is a representation of the of the cyber physical commons. In other words. Things that we're interested in are not the low level protocols, but the properties that those protocols have. So we're examining things like the trigger function, which is a designed piece. We can look at different trigger functions. And in particular, I started off by just doing an analysis that shows the way that the required conviction explodes as the amount of, token, uh, the amount of reserve currency worth of funding you're requesting goes up and it creates a hard boundary that says no more than 20% because this red is going to infinity. That's why it's log scaled. But it also increases in token supply so that you can't just um, mint tokens to get what you want. You have to actually also get people behind what you're doing. Um, this is kind of high level. So you can just see that I'm setting up a bunch of computational experiments. I defined my trigger function. I set my theta, my kappa, my initial sale price. I do some, there's some other um, files that contain generators that create the initial conditions. And in this case, those initial conditions, I'm just gonna sort of show you. Total reserve, since it's, you know, whatever people raise. Initial funds, this is based on the theta. And then I can even randomize the population. So I get a bunch of people and their social interconnections with each other. I get a group of proposals and their um, and the degree to which they're overlapping as underlying data. This is private information. We're not assuming that in the real world we know the social connections or the proposal interaction, but from a simulation and testing perspective, we can define these things and then randomize and introduce them or even ask questions like, what if it's like this? What if it's like that? And so, you know, I just plotted in this example a bunch of just that data that got generated. So a distribution of holdings, a distributions of funds requested per proposal, private information about how each person feels about each proposal, all generated to create a scenario. And then our design contains a variety of parameters that we could choose. Some of these parameters, like this one, are assumed 
and we're just saying, hey, let's think people are so sensitive, they respond so aggressively to certain phenomena. Other things are system parameters, like T men is the minimum number of days before a proposal can pass, even if it has enough conviction. So, you know, one thing that I would do here as I'm refining it would be to maybe structure this into two groups. One group, which is parameters that we're designing, and others which are better represented as assumptions, like this sensitivity. Likewise, these completion rates, these are like average time periods to complete on the average time, like basically they're, they're numbers that characterize phenomena that we don't know. And this params object is sweepable, meaning that if you put more than one number in this list, you can say, well, what if it's 100? What if it's a thousand? What if it's ten thousand? And it will run multiple copies of the experiments to give you the data to look at how sensitive your results are to those um, those particular um, those assumptions. And so, when we actually use CAD CAD, we're going to define the, essentially the number of runs, so the time periods. In this case, time is weeks, um, but we can define what what one time period is the number of time periods per run. And this Monte Carlo is the number of repeated experiments. Because it's driven by random processes in order to get confidence and like certainty levels, you actually can set this number to be many runs. And then you end up with what is essentially a, a multi-layer header here. It contains your parameter specification. It con contains your simulation specification and everything that you would need to reproduce the experiment. Um, See, I think one one really good thing to to touch on in the simulation is what we realized about proposal spam, and I think that's a good really a good why use case for CAD CAD. Um, just basically being able to, is that was that in CAD CAD three? Uh, proposal spam meaning like the the fact that proposals will die if they don't have enough support. Right. That is in it's in the results. I can. I'm I'm gonna maybe well let me let me kind of take I'm almost to the part where I can show results. I'm still okay. just trying to show kind of what it is. So um honestly, like then you have a system we talked about initializing the bonding curve earlier. Regardless of whatever that system is, it has some initial conditions. And since it evolves in time, it evolves from its current um state. And this is a multi-level model in the sense that these keys can be objects. And so in particular, these initial conditions have you know, a funding level, we have this collateral reserve, which we were calling, from our discussion earlier, we're calling collateral. We have a sort of this zero one measure of overall sentiment that we're using as an assumed variable to help us understand the dynamics where, hey, good things are happening, people are gonna continue to put in funds, or maybe if projects are failing frequently, or you know, there's, at negative outcomes, we would then decrement sentiment, sort of see how the feedback through sentiment, consider this like a hidden variable that we're modeling, um, the kind of thing that we might estimate from live data, but in the models, they're just numbers that kind of come out of the system model. Um, but all of that actually boils down to this thing, which we call a generalized differential equation. And this dictionary is probably better expressed using um, diagrams. So. In this model, it's just behavior, and then what the heck is happening? Someone, I must have this open on two, you know, I must have this open twice because it's angry at me. Um, hold on. Um, this dictionary represents conceptually this separation of behavior and consequence of behavior. And so if we've seen, um, Another, there's another diagram that's very common. Um, uh, open source. This. I'm going to show you this diagram because it's it comes up very frequently for understanding the the possibility or the principles at play here. Uh, loading. Hold on. Interesting. It's, Come on, here it is. Okay, so this diagram, open a new tab. This diagram is a conceptual representation of a generalized differential equation. It basically says there's some action or inputs that are determined by behavior. And while those behaviors are driven by 
some knowledge of how the world works, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping because other people are acting, things are happening. There's a state transition where you do people do stuff and then the state changes. And this creates a dynamic. It makes things change in time. All the mechanisms actually do is enforce the rules, like in the case of the bonding curve. They don't dictate what will happen, only what can. And so the trajectory of what actually happens is a byproduct of the actual activity, which is itself a byproduct of private information. So whenever we're talking about systems that are driven fundamentally by humans, the private information is the real driver of the real system. Private information influences behavior, which in turn influences state change, but then state change in turn influences future behavior. So you get these dynamical processes. And what we're sort of showing with our like robot and marbles examples is that if we view this as a network, then you can get some really non-trivial interaction effects because you have both spatial and temporal feedback. And you know, this is why these things are hard. And what we're trying to do is maybe not blow people up with you know, super micro details about all of the individual transactions, helping them zoom out and understand both from the design and from the living system what this what's actually happening and that brings us back to the notebooks here where suddenly after we run our experiments we actually just want to look at some high level stuff so i ran a parameter sweep on on the alpha which is the conviction accumulation rate and i showed that you know actually if i set this too low then the, the, the conviction wasn't powering up enough and uh no funds actually got nothing got passed because there was never enough momentum or enough conviction behind anything. So the funds are just sort of accumulating. It's a little bit naive. But then we have situations where we turned up that parameter and we see a little bit more funds being issued, turned it up even more, and it's, it's actually more. So you're starting to see the sensitivity of the system to the choice of the parameter alpha. But once I do that at a high level, or I'm just looking at experiment over experiment, if I really want to dive in and see something meaty, then I probably want to look at one experiment. So I picked the, there were three. So I picked, you know, the, the last one, index two, and I did some sort of data science decomp. I just basically took data out of the graph. Because Wait, can, I, can I just jump in there? And, and cause I think, I think Jeff makes a really good point about like really needing to explain the why. And it's like, it, I, I think in simple terms, the why is that these complex systems, it's very difficult to, guess a parameter and to design the parameters around these systems without really simulating the system first. And what you're about to dive into is like, look, here's, here's where we can now test what happens if we choose this parameter versus this parameter versus this parameter and how it affects the overall system, yeah. which is clearly uh, yeah. huge. It, the it challenge I run into here is that like from, you know, obviously this is meant to be sort of a brainstorm with you guys because, you know, there's just so much here that it's not immediately clear even what the right stuff to talk about is. So even with this model, this prototype, if I go back, the thing I was showing you is still only just experiments. The actual logics are inside of like this file that contains the bonding curve. Uh, yeah, but, uh, can you stay? Can you stay on CAD CAD three and and go through the different parameter sweeps and the results? Because that's you know I think it's I think it, we get too deep in the woods uh, and we're about to go into conviction voting. So yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I it's just that there's only so I have, let me think. I have some test runs from other projects. I have some definitions I can share. Actually, let me let me do something first. Um, I'm allowed to share these. I think this might be helpful because again, CAD CAD, we talk about methods and tools. The engineering tools are only as useful as the engineering work that precedes it, the design work that you're, te because you're testing and parameter sweeping and A-B testing things. And like what is important to understand is that, you know, those diagrams that we made for the cyber physical commons are part of the, the overall the system level design. They encode conservation equations that are enforced by the actual protocols. And so what we end up doing is creating something like a value conservation diagram, like this one for continuous organizations, where 
there's another lower level representation, which is the exact maths that are like what we were looking at with the bonding curves earlier today. And then when you have this value conservation view, you can also create what is a, a differential equations view. And this is like those dictionaries that I was showing you, but instead of a dictionary that's hard to interpret, we're talking about sort of the, the environmental conditions or assumptions, things that we can model in, in design and we can collect real data for with live systems. Then we have pink, which is the representations of user behavior. And we use models from behavioral economics and researchers that I've worked with to help understand what's realistic in these levels, ranging from rational to bounded rational to well-known observed heuristics. And then we have this last bucket, which is stuff that you're designing as the, as the creator of the system. Like in the continuous organization, there's a theta associated with how much funding gets into the collateral reserve versus how much goes for the organization to spend. And so this is an important parameter because it greatly affects the system's holistic properties, even though it's a, like kind of a, a one parameter. And so when we run experiments, we're doing a encoding of a system that says, this is the decision-making layer at the top. This is the uh, logical accounting that fits the sort of natural laws or the physics. Then we get new state updates. And then the new state updates are used to compute KPIs or metrics, or these are holistic, like, is this system healthy? And they depend a lot on the system. So I'm gonna jump back to the conviction model, but- Wait, can, we, can we go up? So, so just in summary, there's, there's three types of variables. There's the variables that we can control, which are in green, the pentagons to the right, right? Yep. Those are variables that we design and we can use CAD CAD to like determine and parameterize. And then there's user actions, which is kind of like an agent-based simulation simulation that we can do within CAD CAD so that we can like uh, and that can be iterate, iterate and get better as we as we uh, as we understand how users interact with the system. And then we basically have noise, right? Like random. It's random. not just noise. So it's important to understand that when the system is not live, these things are experiments, they're models. We say, suppose the following. When the systems are live, yellow is generally replaced with real data. So we have an understanding that these are conceptually unknown and without a system, but they can be still stated. And then we want to define them in such a way that when we start getting real system that we can estimate them. So yeah. then so then we add a lot of noise to the user actions probably. Yeah, we add noise to both these external processes and the user actions. So for example, speculative pressure, like you could have constant speculation, you could have variable speculation, you could have no speculation, all of that will affect the inputs to this demand. And the demand is something that's a precursor to our assumptions about user behavior. So there's a there's sort of a what we would call the hidden stuff that we don't necessarily know. We still need to represent it in our models. And then we're using, again, sort of estimation theory to understand the degree to which we can guess the state of these things from observed data in the live system. And in the design space, we're just saying, we don't know, so let's try as many things that we can think of. Jeff, did you have something? Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, I, I, I love all this. This is very deep in the how. Um, so, I mean, we have, we have Jordy here, and we're talking about CAD-CAD. So let's make a case for why CAD-CAD is useful to a person like Jordy. So if we go back to the, the CAD CAD uh, 3, and can you scroll to the uh, proposal spam section? Because we realized a really important thing about conviction voting, even just like as soon as Z um, threw this together, and he started doing some parameter sweeps, and he realized that if there are too many proposals on the table at any one time, not mm -hmm. enough conviction can flow to any one for it to pass. So I think I have to change, hold on, let me, I think I ran this, let me make sure this is running because I said the proposal spam was if I look at experiment two. So let me see if this is good and running. So let me go back. So if you can find that, I'll keep explaining the, the how that's important to us building conviction voting. So 
we are looking at a novel form of governance that is going to be, you know, we're, we're putting this out to the community. We're saying, hey, everybody, look, we have a new way to continuously broadcast votes. This is really cool. If we just hit the code, we wouldn't even know that it might fail if you have proposals banned. So we recognized right away, because we simulated before we went to code, that if you have too many proposals on the table at any one time, the conviction is spread among so many that none of them can hit the threshold and pass. We identified a systemic failure mode before one line of code had been written. So this is the value of CAD CAD. And you can do this, I mean, that was just one failure mode that we found. We might find that certain parameters lead to completely unstable system behavior. So we can now bound our parameters and say, okay, alpha should be between five and 100. Beta should be, um, and also the way we're, we're designing these, you know, Zargon is using like um, uh, electron repulsion formulas for uh, how we bound the upper bound of what you can take out of the funding pool. So we're using, um, you know, the, the uh, biomimetic uh, mathematics and you plug it into here and you can see how the system behaves uh, when you do parameter sweeps, Monte Carlo analyses, and you can identify where the system will fail so you can plan mechanisms so now we know to eliminate proposal spam, we need to put some kind of stake on the proposal. So there has to be some mechanism to prevent uh, just someone flooding the system with proposals. So this is an important mechanism that we're able to, to plan for now before we get into any uh, code at all. So I think this is the real value proposition for CAD CAD. Um, once we establish that, we can really get people excited about how it works because it is, I mean, as you say, how do you model an economy? How do you simulate an economy? Most people, uh, in the world today, I think it's impossible, and I would agree in our like real world economies that are plagued with black markets and gray markets and none of that can be figured out. But when you put an economy on the chain, it is a rich temporal data flow that you can study and analyze and train agents and algorithms to, you could train a, a profit seeking bot, you know, a, a profit maximizing bot that wants to uh, take over the system and make as much money as possible and then run that simulation and see what happens. You could program an altruistic agent, the one who gives his money to all the hippie dreams and so on, and you can see how that works. And all of that is possible because all of this economic information is, is now captured on chain. So it's it's very complex. As you can see, there are multiple layers. I think this is a definite how, you know, how are all these things set up? And even lower than that, you have these behavior diagrams that Zargon was just showing. This is how this came about. But these are multiple layers of how complexity, and I think we really need to establish the why so that people are excited to listen further. And I yeah. think iterations are a huge part of this too, right? Like the fact that we're iterating and then going forward, you know, we get to we get to do this once, and we will learn certain things about conviction voting, like proposal spam, from the first time we do it. But then when we learn from building it once, we already have something set up where we could just add one, you know, oh, you know what, we didn't realize this was gonna be an issue, but in application, it was. So let's add that into the simulation and figure out what parameters we need to tweak for the second iteration to improve it, to prevent it from happening again. And I feel like CAD CAD in the iterative process is going to be invaluable and it's going to speed up the iterative process not only for us making iterations but if someone sees a way they can improve they just have to add a few lines of code to see if their their proposal will work and we can say definitively yeah actually that's a great idea here's the cad cad simulation that shows how that affects the the overall system or actually that idea to fix things breaks things over here it's a complex system I understand that that wouldn't be obvious, of course, but here we have the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I, and also, like, again, this is kind of tough because we ha even here we have a pretty split audience, and I'm trying to find, and unfortunately, because this was sort of haphazard, I didn't really know what the goals were. I have some example anonymized results from a from um, some work that I can share, but I can't find them right now. And those are all just test criteria and results. It's engineering workflow outputs, not code. And I'm gonna probably make sure that Jeff gets that and can maybe distribute later because it sounds like it's actually closer to what you're asking about, which is again, it's not like how, it's why. And for why you really need to understand the scientific process, the scientific design process, which says, 
you know, I want to be an architecture firm. I want to design a building. I actually don't care as much about all the structural engineering equations. I care about the fact that that I can show that all of them combine to make a stationary building that can absorb the shocks of an earthquake, not like all of the low level exact details of every beam. And this is what the engineering design in CAD is for. And so what we're talking about is not the construction, we're talking about design and design validation and uh, understanding the implications. So if I try to go back to the... the well, are there any questions though? Yeah, go for it, Jordi. Some are more technical, some are more high level. Let's start first with the technical. What about uh, does CapCat support uh, sensitivity analysis? Say that again. Sensitivity analysis, just to know what are the, so how, uh, how important are the variables? Yeah. So, which one variable? Let me open a, I think I actually have um, more useful information in a, in a keynote deck actually from talking about how to do science. What do you mean sensitivity analysis? Mainly sometimes you have uh, different variables and so different yeah. parameters of the system, but you know is, okay, how much, so how much, um, um, what's the sensitivity? You know, if you touch a little bit this parameter, how the change, the system will change. Maybe sometimes you touch a little bit something, and then you have like a different yeah. system. Yeah, that's there are exactly what it's for. It's like the feature one. set is designed around those workflows, Jordi. It's just that right now I'm having trouble finding the right stuff to share because most of our practice has been closed. So I can't just like pull up the like we had a. a 40 page report running 12 different tests of examining like seven different parameters under a variety of conditions for a client. And that was to help make recommendations about parameter choices for them with a high degree of like, okay, this is sensitive, this is insensitive. Maybe this other thing becomes sensitive when if I pick one variable and I move it in a certain direction, it might actually make another variable become more sensitive. It's actually like, it's actually very um, challenging and effective to build test grids, design conditions, and run computational experiments to answer questions. So what I was showing you guys in this example that's up now is really more of a short one-off where it kind of gives, is meant to kind of give a sense of this experimentation. Here we had a scenario where you know, the proposals were really big and what we saw was it had to accumulate a lot of funds and then one passed and then it accumulates a lot of funds. And again, like it's more of a just like, here, let me verify some stuff and almost more like storytelling in the sense that I'm showing, you know, some conditions, proposals are just accumulating, almost nothing's passing, but that's because I changed some variables. Then Jeff had asked about the proposal spam condition. And so what I was showing in this one is, lots and lots of proposals. Maybe I'll go to the end time, uh, which I think is something like, I don't remember how long I ran this for. Um, you'll, and you'll see a bunch of, a bunch more proposals and like the fact that very few of them are passing. I, again, actually you can probably see it here too. Only this one proposal passed at this one point in time and it was a very large proposal. And, and again, this is like expository a little bit. Um, yeah, you can see, in this period, there are lots and lots of proposals, but only one of them ever passed. And this is something that can happen under certain conditions. And again, with your point, you want to explore the different conditions. I just like, I wish I had a better sense of what we'd wanted to do with this because I, I have materials for like a bunch of different audiences. One is about the scientific process itself, which is just presentations about what sensitivity analysis testing is, how it fits into a workflow, like why you need to do engineering versus examples of the specific code versus examples of the designs. It's not like a, um, it's not that isolatable because it's the scientific process. CAD CAD is just a tool. The actual, the actual thing that we're talking about is engineering practice that starts with what am I really trying to accomplish? What can I realistically enforce? What do I not know? 
what do I have to test about what I don't know in order to be confident in my design and to iterate forward on the designs and then secondarily iterate on the implementation and the parameter choices after you've deployed by integrating new data to improve your understanding of the system. But ultimately what it all it actually is, is bringing differential equations to business or economic logic from the circuits world, saying that we can actually use CAD, CAD to express not just the state of the system, but actually rather the way the system works. And by doing that, we can use this engineering principle and this design paradigm around CAD, but the CAD itself is just, is, is just the tool, the method is what matters. Are, are there are there other questions that other people have? Any others? Yeah. yeah. It's more of a question is, you know, some concerns. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have experience, I think we don't, I have some experience in systems where uh, we talked that before. That are not economic, you know, that are more engineering, engineering uh, systems. And that are not uh, game uh, game theoretic uh, online. So you have the external parameters are random noise, uh, you know, the wind or things that are not uh, hackable. You know, something that you don't have a real person uh, acting as a, an enemy on the system or that. Uh, when I put the both things together, you know, going to the economic um, to the economic world. And going to this uh, game theoretical on top of that, that's where my mind blows more. You know, it's like, okay, this is out of my out of my uh, comfort uh, comfort territory, and it's like out of my comfort zone. Uh, I know that, for example, from the economics perspective, you know, okay, economic modeling has been a subject for many years, and there's a lot of people that's working. Uh, what I always listen is that these economic models, uh, you know, they are not useful for, for predicting the future, even they are trying to do, so it's not uh, for future. But yeah, they are very, very helpful for understanding how the system works, you know, how, what really happens. Uh, just by designing, it. you know, you design something and maybe you are not getting anything new, but you will learn so much doing it that Actually, the the real the real the real value is that you will have people that really understand what are the the mechanics, the internals, the you know the the things that are inside. So, it's, you know, it's very difficult to to design for the future, but you can. They're very useful for understand what well, you're talking what, about. Unfortunately, like what I'm, I'm trying to make a strong separation here between economic decision theory and automation and like formal. So not game theory just from like economists, but the game theory differential games and the game theory of aerospace robotics and control. The yeah, 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 that's, I, I put it to, to I just split them at them all, all the all the place. The thing is that here is. Uh, we are introducing to my, I and mean, it's just my it's a personal side, eh? but to my mind, I'm, a, I'm more or less as an engineer, as an any engineer, uh, well, it's more or less familiar with uh, uh, control, con uh, control theory, you yep. know, more or less. Uh, uh, heard about uh, you know, uh, feedback design system, uh, it's typical, this is more or less something that's more or less familiar. It's a huge subject, but you know, people yeah. more or less understand. The main area how it works uh here is you know the two concepts that in, are on top of the engineering is one is the economics part the engineer is not an economist uh, uh, economics they use this kind of modeling system for for working with economics but it's like out of the scope of the engineering you know, it's, right? it's no no i totally agree with you so what you're what you're getting at though is the reason why my current like the research I was referring to either earlier is I have a roadmap roadmap with multiple engineers, network scientists, control theorists, and economists because what I'm working on in beyond this is the proper like cross application of epistemologically strong control theoretic methods 
to the high domain of applicability, which are these real systems that have this adversarial layer in them. And in fact, the reason why the models don't really leverage controls effectively today is because we don't adequately bound the relationship between the, um, the, the, the realizable and the realizations. And so if I actually, I have to switch to a different deck, but there's a really important slide about the difference between um, uh, the difference between the reachable spaces and the configuration spaces. This is again like robotics-y stuff, but it's like not characterizing what will happen. It's characterizing what can happen, reducing phase spaces, and essentially using manifolds to say, yeah, lots of things could happen, but only these lots of things. And so engineering in, a, in an adversarial resistant, in a controls engineering paradigm requires you to move beyond the direct description of the data towards the description of the system. And in doing so, you end up in what is essentially ma a mathematically intense regime where you need tools and you need to be able to run experiments. And what I was trying to get at is in particular, this one. Actually, I'll start here. So um, with your little bit of, I apologize for the people who this is too much into the weeds, but we're describing a mechanism as a means of transforming the state of a system, which is state dependent, but also action. Oh, uh, yeah, I cannot see. Your screen's not, it's, it's, it's all black. Uh, so if I- That's okay. better. But now you can't see it, right? It's just uh, no, we can see it. So for Jordy's benefit, basically what I'm trying to say to make the bridge to controls, and this is the discussions I've been having with the controls and economics academics, is that if we formalize the notion of a state transition yep. and then we unpack it, what we're actually talking about is a separation between what people do, which is not under our control, which is they look at what their the state is, including their private part, and they just decide what to do, and we can't control that. But what we can control or design is the mapping from the what the current state is and their action and what the new state is. That's what a mechanism is. And so as we move to more rigorous, more mathematical methods, we're controlling the reachable spaces through invariant laws or dissipativity laws, passive systems. They don't actually say what people will do at all. They only say what people can do, but because of essentially processing of that information, there are still bounds and restrictions on what can happen. And so when we get into things like, you know, these energy defined systems, we're actually able to use experiments to test certain sensitivities, the capabilities of the system to do estimations. And we actually view these social systems less as making anyone do anything and more as formal estimators. They essentially process information that comes from humans. The human's activity is the source of information. We're not making them do things. We're taking their actions as information and synthesizing that information more efficiently through system theory. And so your question about experiments, like I like to use this diagram as an explanation of, you know, the kinds of features that are exposed in CAD CAD for why, like what types of analysis would I run? Okay, cool, I can run a one-off. I can run a Monte Carlo where I explore some noise process. I can run a, parameter sweep where I look at the sensitivity to a particular choice. I can actually run multiple parameters sweep to get some cross grids. I can run them on Monte Carlo in, I take a function and I swap one trigger function out for another to get an AB test. Like the point here is to support the computational scientific workflow. The actual engineering task is still just engineering. You have to be able to make the model of the system that you care about and then use the tool to ask and answer questions about parameter choices, or obviously once you connect in real data, if you're using system identification, you're saying, hey, there's a bunch of stuff about the system I don't know, but I can actually start to estimate those unknowns by combining data and a model. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, 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 that's great. You know, that's, as you know, from the, it's, it's a very new thing, you know, it's, 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 it's a good thing. So it's like a very interesting thing. Uh, the only thing that I put on the table is that, you know, first, if, and I'm talking more about 
the marketing that uh, we got pull on that. It's yeah. like when you are going, if you try, you know, it's different. If the target is uh, engineers, you will find in general that most of the engineers, they are not, uh, they will not feel comfortable when they, when you talk, to them about uh, the economic, economic, you know, about this economic and economic side. And I would say it's more, he's talking, for example, about my, you know, missile uh, control or things, or do we have an enemy on that? This is, you, you add the game theory on that, on, on, on the questions and all that stuff. Again, uh, this is not something that a normal, normal engineer will, um, Feel, feel for comfortable on that so you probably will find some um uh, and say some yeah i would say uh, skepticism on, on on that that's the kind of things because it's very much because of unknown is what i told you before is because uh i never studied this kind of systems i'm not an economist you know no, but you're, you're to, to so jordy the issue here is that no one has done that so the only reason that this is so hard and the reason it's an exploration and why I don't have short answers for you guys is because literally I'm going around. I, I met with the chair of the controls engineering department at TU Munich last week. I'm working with the Vienna economics group. I've got like collaborators at Penn. The problem here is that the skills are siloed away from each other. You need to have data science skills, economic skills, and engineering skills in order to do this. And those are all already pretty apart from each other. And they have a lot to do with automation in the sort of robotic sense. And so when you start to combine those, there really isn't anyone. So the real challenge here is that we're struggling to figure out how to educate, how to motivate. And this short expositions thing that I just pulled up is my working roadmap with a, like a variety of collaborators to try to start producing short motivational texts that explain just the definitions and start to build in the theory because you can't practice something if you don't understand the theory and the theory bridges both the data science or the data science the economics and the engineering principles so like there's no one group that has these skills so we're having to start to like recruit and educate and like build a community around just the expertise itself Hey, so uh, we got to take a quick five minute break uh, and then dive into conviction voting. Do you, yeah, do you have obviously, I'm more helpful. It's like this is actually a real point of challenge for us, and it's it's largely because of the reasons that Jordy says there isn't anyone that I can just go to and say, "Hey, you know this stuff." Instead, we're having to build language bridges between economists, control engineers, computer scientists, data scientists. And these people don't speak the same language. This makes me feel a little bit better, but you know, that's not answer. You know, the problem is that does, does not solve the problem. But anyway, this is good. Okay, it's good to know uh, that we are in this stage. Uh, this is, but just it's something that I think it's important to to all of us be aware. Uh, what's this? You know, this is not. Uh, but this is why we're fundraising for CAD CAD. It's because the point is not that CAD CAD is like technically we have a tool and we have a method and we apply the method in private essentially. And what we're trying to do is like take that outside of private and make it public and educate it and document it. And there's a very large commons problem associated with CAD CAD. It, there's, there's labor to educate, there's labor to build, there's labor to research, there's labor to bridge. Like I'm working with dozens of people in different fields to try to make this happen. And part of the reason it's in this funding request is because it's not done because we have to do this work. Yeah. Okay. We got to take a break. Uh, be back in five. And I'm going to start drawing. Did you want to do commission money? I was planning. You should let Jeff do it. I think. <laughs> you, you can do it because I mean, you want me to draw? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, man, your uh, your graphs are getting really sharp. I've been drawing lots. <laughs> yeah, you still have an hour, right? One hour. It's like okay. So, uh, so I'm, ho take I'm hoping. Yeah, we can take five minutes. Um, but I'm hoping. Well, in fact, I'll end the live stream and then restart it. Yeah, and I am. I'm sorry. I like. I, 